So good morning, everyone. Hope you are doing well. In today's uh, session, which is my lecture number 68 for my Mastering Endocrine and Diabetes Lecture Series, I'm going to take us through a journey of NICE lipid guidelines, which were released in May 2023. Uh, I'll do this via case-based approach, which will be helpful for you to solve several questions across specialty certificate, European board exams, and MRCP exams. Of course, it's a very hot topic um, in terms of the endocrinology exams plus very useful in clinical practice as well. So let's start right away. So first and foremost, uh, NICE guidelines clearly define that we need to do a full formal risk assessment to estimate the CVD risk within the next 10 years. Of course, we are talking here about primary prevention. So patients without CVD, type 2 diabetic patients without CVD, age between 25 to 84, we should definitely do a formal risk assessment. Why are using? a tool which they refer to as the QRIS-3 tool. This is the latest. Before in the past, before 2018, we were using QRIS-2. So this is how the QRIS-3 calculator looks like. It can be easily uh, uh, put online from the website. Uh, we just put QRIS-Q3 and it takes you to the calculator to do the calculation. It incorporates the age, the sex of the patient. Of course, the age should be between 25 to 84. It incorporates the sex, the ethnicity. If we have a UK postcode, we need to put that. Smoking status, diabetes status, angina or heart attack in a first degree relative less than 60 years of age. CKD, here we have to remember that it includes stage three, four, and five. This was a question in the previous exams as well. So atrial fibrillation, the patient is on blood pressure treatment or not. Do you have migraines? This is a further... Uh, Inclusion, these criteria specifically for migraine, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, from the QRS2, these were not much included in the previous calculators. Uh, severe mental illness, is a patient on atypical antipsychotic medication, are you on regular steroid tablets, a diagnosis of or treatment for erectile dysfunction. And again, uh, if we have the values of cholesterol to HDL ratio, we can input that, systolic blood pressure, we will input the BMI uh, based on the height and the weight of the patient. So this is all uh, parts of the QRS3 calculator. Consider people aged 85. This is also clearly mentioned in the latest update guidelines. Consider people aged 85 or older to be at increased risk of CVD because of age alone. So this is for the patients aged 85 and above. Between 25 to 84, we have to use the QRS3 calculator. Uh, above 85, they should be considered at increased risk of CVD by itself because of their age alone particularly if they smoke or if they have a high blood pressure. So this is from the 2023 update. Let's see the first question. Again, all these questions which I'm going to discuss in this lecture series have actually appeared as uh, questions in the previous specialty certificate, MRCP, and the European board exams. So these are all like a recall of the previous uh, exams um, in terms of uh, the lipid questions. So the question number one, uh, is uh, according to the NICE lipid guidelines, CG181, do not use risk assessment for which of the following group of patients? Type 1 diabetics or patients who have an EGFR less than 60 and or albuminuria, patients with familial hypercholesteremia or all of the above. So if we were to look at the guidelines, it's clearly mentioned in the guidelines that do not use a risk assessment tool for people who are at high risk of CVD, okay? So people who are already at high risk of CVD do not use a risk assessment tool, including people with type 1 diabetics. We'll be looking specifically what is the specific criteria used to start a statin for a type 1 diabetic patient in the subsequent slides. Patients with an estimated EGFR of less than 60 and or albuminuria, and those patients with familial hypercholesterol. So in this three group of patients, we should not use a risk assessment tool. And that's why the correct answer for this question number one will be all of the above. This is specified by the guidelines. Again, very important thing in the guidelines mentioned is that we should recognize that CVD risk tools may underestimate the risk in certain group of people, including but not limited to people treated for HIV, people already taking medications to treat CVD risk factors, people who have recently stopped smoking, people taking medications that can cause dyslipidemia such as immunosuppressant drugs, 
people with severe mental illnesses and people with autoimmune diseases and other systemic inflammatory disorders. So we may underestimate the risk in certain group of people and that's why we should keep in context these conditions when we are estimating the CVD risk. What about the role of aspirin for primary prevention in cardiovascular disease? The guidelines clearly mention do not routinely offer aspirin for primary prevention of CVD disease. Again, this is itself asked as a question in the previous exam. What about the lifestyle changes as advised by the guidelines for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease? So what they have defined as a cardioprotective diet is they have advised people at high risk or with CVD to eat a diet in which the total fat intake is 30% or less of the total energy intake. Saturated fats are 7% or less of the total energy intake and where possible, saturated fats are replaced by monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Now, I'm emphasizing on this statement because uh, in the previous exams, this has also appeared as a question where they have given these percentages in different forms uh, to confuse, uh, but this is the correct thing which we should note and the statement which we should definitely remember for the exams uh, that uh, they are definitely going to bring up this because this is a cardioprotective diet as advised by NICE. Advise people at high risk of or with CVD to reduce their saturated food intake, increase their monounsaturated fat intake with olive oil, rapeseed oil or spreads based on these oils and to use them in the food preparation. Okay. But make sure that you remember this percentage of saturated fats of 7% or less and overall fat intake to be 30% or less because this has been asked in the previous exams. Now, question number two, according to NICE lipid guidelines, which of the following Q risk, uh, which of the following Q risk three 10 year risk predictors of cardiovascular disease should be the threshold for introduction of statin therapy in a 45 year old type two diabetic patient. So basically they are talking about that. What is the percentage of the Q risk three score, which will predict the 10 year risk of getting a CV disease, which should be used as a threshold for initiating a statin therapy in a type two diabetic patient. So option number one, there is no such threshold risk. The patient should be treated directly with the statin. Is it 5%, 10%, 15% or 20%? So let's look at the correct answer. The correct answer is 10%. So lipid modification therapy for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease defines that we should offer 20 milligram of utter was statin for the primary prevention of CVD to people who have a 10 year risk, Q3 risk score of 10% or more. And that's the whole point of using the calculator in a type 2 diabetic patient aged between 25 to 84 years of age. Do not rule out treatment with atorvastatin 20 mg for the primary prevention of CVD just because the patient's 10-year risk score is less than 10% if they have informed preference for taking a statin or there is a concern that the risk may be underestimated. So as I told you that special populations in which the risk may be underestimated, uh, we should... Uh, Keep a low threshold for initiating statin in these patients, even if the risk score is less than 10%. However, the clear threshold in all the other population as a primary prevention, as per the QRS3 score, is 10% uh, or more. What about people age 85 and older? As I already mentioned, that they are already considered at high risk for uh, their age alone, especially if they smoke or they have a high blood pressure. So they should be offered at a in 20 mg. This is clearly specified in the guidance. Let's look at question number three. A 36-year-old man with a 21-year history of type 1 diabetes is reviewed in the clinic. He feels well, denies any hypoglycemia, but historically has poor glycemic control. On examination, a blood pressure is 151 by 77 mmHg. On the higher side, BMI is uh, on 29, foot examination reveals no evidence of neuropathy, while retinal screening reveals bilateral background retinopathy. So this is clearly a type 1 diabetic patient with a very long duration of his diabetes, almost 21-year history. He's currently 36-year-old. Current medications include Novomix 30 uh, and 42 units uh, twice daily. Investigations reveal HbA1c not well controlled at 8.9%, total cholesterol 5.2, LDL 3.1, 
definitely high. HDL 1.3, plasma triglycerides 1.7, and microbial infiltration ratio also elevated at 6.9. According to the following, which is the correct approach to treat this man's lipid profile according to the NICE guidelines. Now, this patient is definitely not on a statin at the moment, which he should be on. And what is the advice in this regard for a type 1 diabetic patient with such a long duration of his diabetes uh, condition? So according to the NICE guidelines, CG181, which is the 2020 guidelines, we should offer the patient atorvastatin 20 mg. We should offer the patient atorvastatin 80 mg. We should just advise him about the diet because his LDL is 3.1. We should give him azetimib or we should give him phenofibrid. Correct answer is aterostatin 20 mg. Now, primary prevention in terms of type 1 diabetic patients. So clearly they have defined that we should offer statin treatment for primary prevention of CVD to adults with type 1 diabetes who are aged older than 40 years. So this patient was less than 40 years, but his duration of diabetes was more than 10 years, almost 26 years. I mean, when, more than 20 years history of type 1 diabetes, this patient had. So if they are aged older than 40 years or uh, who have had diabetes for more than 10 years or those who have an established nephropathy or have other CBD risk factors. Now, this patient already has um, nephropathy as well. We can see the raised age here. So he has enough criteria to be started on uh, statin therapy. The duration of diabetes itself is a criteria in his uh, scenario to be started on uh, statin therapy. So when starting treatment with a statin for adults with type 1 diabetes, guidelines recommend using again aterostatin 20 mg. Let's move on to case number 4. We have a 45-year-old male admitted with STEMI, which is uh, ST segment elevation MI or myocardial infarction. Prior to that, he was on 20 mg aterostatin for the last 3 years. He is on known diabetic on combination oral medications, which is recent advance of 6.7%. LDL cholesterol is found to be 3 millimole per liter. What's the next best advice for his statins as per NICE guidelines? Should we keep the same dose of aterostatin 20 mg? Should we shift to Rosua statin 20 mg? Should we give aterostatin 80 mg? Or should we add fibrous to the current dose of aterostatin? So here we are talking about secondary prevention because this patient already had an event and already on statin uh, for the last three years. So the correct answer here will be to increase his dose of aterostatin and give him 80 mg of aterostatin. So lipid modification therapy for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease states that we should uh, use the dose of 80 mg of aterostatin. Uh, we should make sure that we should keep into context many other things. What is, we may need to use a lower dose if the, any of the following apply, there is a chance of a drug interaction higher risk of adverse events or patient preference for that matter if he has any side effects in terms of the mild and everything. Most important is do not delay statin treatment for secondary prevention, but consider lifestyle changes at the same time if appropriate. If the person has had an acute coronary syndrome, like this patient, do not delay statin treatment. Advice regarding the lipid sampling is take a lipid sample on admission and about three months after the start of the treatment. What about patients with CKD or chronic kidney disease? Again, this has been asked in previous exams. Offer aterostatin 20 mg for primary or secondary prevention of CVD to people with CKD. So CKD, both regards need uh, uh, aterostatin 20 mg for primary or secondary prevention. Increase the dose if greater than 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol is not achieved. And the EGFR is still allowing us to increase the dose, which is more than 30 uh, ml per minute uh, per 1.73 meters square or more. Agree the use of higher doses with a renal specialist if EGFR has dropped down below 30. So this is very important that in patients for primary and secondary prevention for people with chronic kidney disease, offer at a certain 20 mg. And we are using the non-SDL cholesterol as a marker and we should aim to increase the dose if greater than 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol is not achieved. So that's the end of the free view of my uh, lecture number 68. If you wish to access this full session, uh, please subscribe to my lecture series. You can send me an uh, inquiry request at mazirules at gmail.com or you can directly WhatsApp me on 0097155743 I have the same number on Telegram as well.
And as I mentioned, uh, overall, currently, I have 68 lectures uh, uh, in this lecture series. Uh, the subscription includes the existing 68 lecture full access, plus all my uh, lectures, which will be forthcoming uh, in the near future, will all be included in the same subscription price. So it's like a lifelong subscription for a one-time subscription fees. Uh, there are several videos on diabetes already in my lecture series. There is a uh, videos which are for high yield topics, which includes all the previous uh, recent exams recalls. I mean, the important themes which have appeared in the previous exams. Uh, there are high yield topics for adrenal, for thyroid. Uh, there are uh, reboots or recalls from the recent exams for specialty certificate and uh, European board. There are several sessions on thyroid, important topics which appear in the exams and the clinical practice as well. There are several topics for uh, covering all the important aspects of adrenals. There is two important sessions on lab endocrinology. Pituitary, we have a different session on uh, Cushing's acromegaly, MRIs. I have also one session on top images for e exams, which includes all the important images which appear for adrenals, for pituitary, for foot x-rays, uh, for that matter, and uh, even for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, sessions on inherited endocrine sy uh, syndromes, reproductive endocrinology, calcium and bone metabolism, and lipids and hyperlipidemia. And this was the latest session, uh, which I've not yet put here, but that is for the NICE Lipid Guidelines 2023. Sessions on pediatric endocrinology. And basically, this is the full session, which you'll get access to once you subscribe to the lecture series. So thank you so much. Uh, hope you all have a great day. Thank you.